How's it everyone? And welcome to the December.NET user group. Today I'm gonna to be talking to you about coding with ghosts. Um, the hidden helpers in software engineering. So as with every story, it has to start somewhere, right? Um, you've seen a lot in Adam's tech news, like everything has just got AI around it. Um, it doesn't feel like a single day goes past where someone's not saying something about AI. Like, it would be great if someone says, look at our new product. It's not smart. It just works. But no, everything's got AR. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to st start you off where in the start of my journey, um, how I got into tech, how I used to code um, quite a while back. And then I'm going to sort of work that forward to where we are now. And I think that helps you like really appreciate where we are at the moment. The world's changed a lot in the last year. Um, it's, it's getting pretty crazy. So a little bit about me, as I mentioned, my name's Gordon Beeming. I'm a father to two uh, kids, one boy, one girl, um, husband, uh, solution architect at SSW and a Microsoft MVP. There's a couple of links there where you can find me on, uh, on different social medias and Yeah, let's go. So as I mentioned, we're gonna start near the start of my journey. So we're gonna start with a trip down memory lane. After that, we're gonna look at how um, the software development works today. Then we're gonna look at some services and libraries that you could use to build great experiences yourself into your own apps for your own customers. And then I'm gonna take a stab at what I think the next little while will look like. I did a talk similar to this a couple of months ago and already it's vastly different to, to that. So we'll see maybe if I can get it right this time. Okay, so my story started a little bit different to most people. Um, generally when someone says like, this is how I got started in uh, computers, they're talking about I was three years old, four years old, Commodore something something, and all this old tech, that wasn't me. <laughs> um, for me, I started on, I think it was Windows 95, but only for a little bit, then on Windows 98, and that was just listening to music. Um, then I completely didn't do anything with computers for a while. In high school, I, I took uh, computers, and for that we were doing Turbo Pascal. And that's sort of where my obsession with computers started so it was grade 11 between obviously between my final year of school and my marks weren't looking that great and the one thing that i hadn't tried to be good at was computers because originally the whole the game plan with computers was just to go to class play games have fun with mates um, and that was working out fine except at some point it kicked in that like i'm actually gonna have to pass my year 12. So one night I started playing around, um, going through like all the, the content that we had and trying to actually get good at this. And then I realized actually I was pretty good, pretty good at this. But if you're looking back at Turbo Pascal today, it had some drawbacks. So has anyone coded recently without IntelliSense? Show of hands? Okay. Not, not many people, two people. It's... Yeah, it's not easy. And when IntelliSense does break, like in my Visual Studio, like the first thing I go and do is find the key bind and like re-enable that. We also had no squiggles back then. So currently you're busy typing stuff and you get warning squiggles and you get error squiggles and you get linting squiggles that tell you like, this is how you can fix your code. We didn't have that. We just knew that if the text was white, then we we're on a reserve word. And if the text was not white, like based on this theme, so if it was yellow, then it was other code. And there was no, it broke here. So we used to change some code, run it, make sure it works, change some code, run it, make sure it works. Because if you go and code for an hour and you're like, let's run it, sometimes you just land up with obscure errors. So like some of these, where it just says, it's expecting a semicolon. Doesn't tell you where. Or maybe there's an invalid numeric format. Again, where is that? What have you changed recently? So 
making small iterative changes was a big part of making sure you were successful at, at writing code with Turbo Pascal back then. And the way I learned was going through the docs. So I loaded up the F1 docs and just read how to use the programming language. And the biggest benefit that I felt I got out of this was the ability to problem solve. So one of the other weird, not that weird, but one of the other aspects of Turbo Pascal is that it's uh, procedural. So if you wanted to call a method, you had to have declared the method higher up in the same function. And then you get into this weird thing where you want to call a method, but it's lower, but then if you reverse it, it doesn't work because you want them to sometimes call each other and things get all kinds of crazy. So some of the problem solving was just around laying out methods, um, but obviously some of it was actual useful stuff. Fast forward two years-ish, and then I started using uh, Visual Studio 2008 and C Sharp. And this was like insanely easy to pick up. And one of the big reasons for that be was because of IntelliSense. So now I was able to start typing some code and I could just push dot and like pretty much all the answers in front of me. I can just go down, read the help files, um, see exactly what each method's gonna do, explore the namespaces and just, and discover my way through code. And through that, you end up learning through typing. So it's less just reading text and it's more actually doing. And because you're doing more, you learn more. And then the interesting kicker, if you consider being in 2023 today, is that when you installed Visual Studio 2008, you had the option to install MSDN docs. So the current Microsoft Learn docs that you easily go online, or if you see something's wrong with it, you just go do a PR and it can get updated. That came to us on a CD. So I'm just going to squirrel quickly on a on a little track down the uh, down the road. I promise it's related. It's related to what I'm talking about. Has anyone downloaded ISOs or anything from mar.visualstudio.com any time recently? It's just a couple of people. So if you have an MSDN subscription. Or if you don't, you can even go and get the Dev Essentials here, and that gives you access to some software. You can go and download ISOs of products. So recently, and the, it's a top a conversation for another time, otherwise I'll squirrel even further, I downloaded Windows XP Service Pack 3 for a very specific problem that I had. Now, back in the day, I couldn't just go and do that. And that's because when you had an MSDN subscription, this is how your content rocked up. And then inside there, you would go find Visual Studio 2008. But because that's on a DVD and the DVD holds about four and a half gigs only, you have another disc, which is the docs. And those used to ship every couple of months. I think there was six months or yearly. Um, and that's when you get your doc updates. So if there's a problem in the docs, you're gonna get it later with the next service pack. That's when you're gonna get docs. And luckily, everything is colorized because you get a lot of CDs. You can see a little bit on the screen there, the green one on the, the bottom left. That is Windows Server 2012. An orange one, that's SQL Server 2012. So you should get this fat stack. All the service packs for all the products, Access, Excel, everything, whole bunch of CDs, whole bunch of keys. And then each time you get your new stack, now you have two sets of all these CDs sitting at home. And from memory, Adam said he still has a lot of his, his CDs uh, sitting at home. But now that I've gone down, I'll come back because the other interesting thing that happened to me when I was using Visual Studio 2008 is I learned about Google. So apparently, people don't learn things by reading docs. That was new to me. They said that you can just Google stuff and people have information out there and they'll help you with things, right? Um, which shows you how far I wasn't on the whole do computer things. And back then I discovered Code Project. So there used to be lots of micro forums. So our user group in South Africa had a very small one called SA Developer. Um, I used Code Project a lot and then obviously Stack Overflow came ar around and then I started using Stack Overflow. But the biggest 
feature for me in VS 2008 was the fact that I could now debug my code. So instead of just running it and seeing does it work the way I want or writing data out somewhere to go and look at it, I could actually step through code like you can today and just see what the values of stuff was, why it's potentially behaving differently. And like for me back then, like that was insane. And the last thing I want to touch on in the past is an extension that I used extensively, um, which was written by Microsoft Research. And this was written in, well, released in 2014. And I'm just going to play this little video from them um, and then mention some things. So yeah, 2014 in February um, is when this was recorded and I'll let him carry on. Many developers search and reuse code from the web. The Bing Code Search add-in for Visual Studio 2013 gives a better code search experience directly inside Visual Studio. After installing the add-in, when you trigger IntelliSense, you will see the How Do I button on top of the auto-completion window. Click the button to open the code search panel. As our first example, we would like to find code to read the file line by line. Note that in the query, the variable file is referenced. After hitting enter, the add-in shows the suggested snippets. The snippet, for example, uses the stream reader class to read the file. As we can see, the variable file appears in the right place. The bottom of the panel displays information about the snippet. We can see the web page where the snippets came from and their titles. You can navigate through snippets from different content providers. For now, we have four partner websites, MSDN, Stack Overflow, .NET Perls, and C Sharp 411. Let me go back to insert this snippet into my code. Now I want to obtain another snippet to generate the MD5 hash code from the contents of the line variable. To do this, I type in the query generate MD5 hash from line. To make the query more clear, we can specify the type of the variable and use the at sign to escape the variable. Now, as before, you can choose the snippet that you like the most. This time I will choose a snippet from Stack Overflow. This is the Bing code search add-in. This extension was, what, eight years ago, nine years ago? And it looks awfully close to something else that we've used probably very recently. The, a, quite a long while back, I remember listening to a video about innovation. And one of the interesting things that I remembered from that is that the speaker said that if you look at anything that feels like very revolutionary today, today being lots of years ago when I first listened to that, said if you look about 10 years before that, you'll see the same thing had come out just before its time. And I think in this case, like if you look at the features of this, the way that it, it works, like Microsoft Research built this nine years ago. And like it's insane, obviously now it's a lot more powerful, um, but it's, so, it's cool to see like how this is then transformed. So that's a bit of the history. And now I'll dive into stuff that we'll probably all be a lot more familiar with um, for our software development today. So recently I've made the switch, which is probably why the tech things has been interesting. I made the switch from Windows to Mac. So I've had to learn a whole bunch of new things, but along with those new things, I've just, I've learned how much better our ecosystem is because my switch to Mac was effortless. There was like one or small, one or two small things that I was like, well, I need Windows for this, um, but nothing that Parallels couldn't solve, where many years back, like that just wouldn't have been the case. So the first thing I wanna talk about for our tools today, is inside VS 2022, is a feature called IntelliCode. And when long ago I felt IntelliSense was this amazing thing, VS 2022 brought us auto line um, completions. And what that's doing is it's not just saying dot, here's your next thing. It's like, you probably want to write this because lots of other, other people did that. And I know you're just going to go to Stack Overflow anyway if I didn't help you, so here's the answer. And the other thing that's pretty neat is repeated edits. So as soon as the IDE detects that you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, it's gonna help you with those changes and just suggest that like, look, you can just tab through 
like you've made this change twice already like let's just tab through and we'll, and we'll get this done quicker so i just want to demo quickly what those look like um, but importantly for this because it in the ide well in most ides this is the same hook point for both github copilot and for um, the autocomplete feature like if you are in vs code or in in full-blown visual studio um, these two won't work together, but if you do have access to GitHub Copilot, it's obviously a, a much more superior experience than what you'd get with the, the plain uh, autocomplete. So yeah, I have a, a standard class, and you can see as I start typing, the IDE is suggesting different property names to me based on what it thinks I might want to do. And then as soon as I go to a new line, it's like, well, he has a last name, he has a title, you probably want those to be initialized to empty. He has an email, he has a phone number. And all I had to do there was push enter and tab, enter and tab, enter and tab. Obviously not every single example is gonna be this simple, but with a lot of APIs and SDKs that you use, with so much code being open source these days, when you start using it, you'll get a suggestion like this, that's like, this is how people are most commonly using um, those SDKs today. Now, in my case, I didn't want to initialize all those variables, and I also don't like warnings. So what I wanted to do is go and make all of these fields required. And as I mentioned, as soon as you start doing repeated edits in the IDE, it's going to start suggesting things. So we'll pop open the hint, we'll choose to enter um, required, and we'll do the same thing there for that property. And as soon as we go across to title now, it says we can push tab. And then it says push tab and go to the next one. And then you just continue pushing tab and go to the next one. In this uh, simple example, it feels like this would be pointless because you could just put your cursor down the bottom, type required. But if you have a much bigger class, I've had this before in controllers where I'm changing how the logging works you start making edits and then it starts saying go tab and it's jumping to places in your code that's like 20, 30, 40 lines apart um, and it's making the same edits for you each time. So I thought that was pretty cool when that came out. Um, but then obviously a year ago, we got ChatGPT. And ChatGPT makes those experiences feel like I don't know, the stone ages. Like it's just, it's just too smart. Or at least it feels like it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and get it to create us a very simple calculator. So we're gonna create a class. We're gonna ask it to calculate the area and the perimeter of some shapes. Then we're gonna provide it some constraints. So as you start using um, these, these tool, tools more and more, you realize what kind of constraints you should uh, provided. Generally, I suppose that's called prompt engineering. Um, I don't know if it works the same way always, but you obviously don't want to start off with something very basic if you know you're going to have to put a blocker in for it. So we'll give it some constraints and then we'll guide it through to a solution that we actually want to use. And that, that we want to use phrase means it's either it works very well for us or from there we want to start doing like sort of the customizations ourselves, because at some point you're going to have a loss in returns on just tr like trying to prompt it to get you a perfect result so if we hop over to chat gpt i'm just going to ask it to create me a c-sharp class that has methods to calculate the area and perimeter of different shapes and then i give it some constraints as i mentioned i want one class two methods um just because otherwise sometimes it'll go crazy and it'll generate me like six different methods or it'll generate me multiple classes and that's not quite what I want in this case. But as you can see when that code shows up, um, it's using magic strings for the switch statement. So I want to change that because I don't like magic strings. It just makes everything harder to use. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask it to please change the string shape to be an enum. And then it goes away and thinks for a little bit. When it comes back, it's like, sure, I'll do this for you. You can see there it's got the enum. It started using that enum in the code. And then the rest of the code, as you can imagine, it's just swapped out those magic strings for, for the different enums. And what's quite nice at the end as well, it always gives you like a little blurb that says like 
this is the current state of the code. If you're asking it a question, it will explain to you at that point, like why this answer, answer uh, meets your original question. But that experience in some ways is not as ideal as the autocomplete experience because you have to go out to ChatGPT for it. So you have to leave your IDE, you go to your browser. When you get to your browser, you then have to remember, oh, what were you asking for again? Then you go back to your IDE again. Potentially you grab some context, you take that context out and it's a very clunky developer experience. So naturally the replacement for that is GitHub Copilot. And GitHub Copilot has many different flavors of the Copilot after the original pilot. So you have chat, which allows you to have a ChatGPT-like experience where you can ask questions about specific code, just ask questions in general. But that all happens from inside your IDE using the context that's available in your IDE. And then there's obviously all the other Copilots. So there's, the, there's business, there's going to be workspaces, there's just all of them. The same as Microsoft's got all the code pilots, GitHub's got all the other code pilots. So let's see a little demo on how this works. So we're going to start off with the same code that we used earlier from uh, ChatGPT. So obviously we don't want to waste that code. It's a good starting point. And then because we got it from the internet and from AI, we're just going to trust it, commit it, ask no questions, right? Because it's ChatGPT, it's, it's not wrong. But then we get asked, did that code actually work? And we're like, well, we don't know. So we'll just go and write some, some very basic um, outputs to test, does everything work? And you can see as I started typing there, it started suggesting the different enums for me with starting values. The problem with that output is it just looks messy. It's a bunch of numbers, it's not very useful. So I'll just add there the area of circle and I'll provide 2.5 because that's the value that they used as their sample. And now as I go onto the next line, you can see each time it's starting with that same, like the right context. So it's saying area of a triangle and these are the sides. Um, and those all match and then our output looks um, quite nice. So the autocompletes before wouldn't have made it that easy and, and pulled all that context together the same way. So the next bit that I want to show you is that say we want to make changes. As I mentioned earlier, you want to use that code as a starting point and then customize it from there. So we can go and ask um, Copilot just to add three more shapes. A very vague requirement, but it's like, sure, there you go. It added it to the enum, added stuff to the calculate area and also to the perimeter. We just set, click accept and now that's part of our code base. And then you might have noticed this little sparkly thing here and Adam had mentioned it as part of the tech news, the other feature that's linked to this, but that allows you to just generate a commit message. So you click that, it goes through all the changes that you've lined up and it suggests um, a commit message for you. Generally, the way you would use this is not like I did. So you would normally generate the message and then you would take that message and maybe massage it a little bit. Um, otherwise, it'll just be a bunch of noise that no one's ever listening to. But then obviously because we added more shapes, we want to verify that all of these work. And again, we just go there, push enter, push tab, push enter, push tab, and everything just works. So what else could we do with Copilot? Well, this line looks a bit scary. So we're gonna ask it, what does it do? And you can see in this example, it said that it's gonna use the, sla the slash explain command to get its output. And now that output is in line in the code. Um, so in real life, I've used this often when I'm working with the Microsoft Graph API, because that's probably the worst documented SDK like on planet Earth. So you just highlight some code and you're like, what is it doing? Or sometimes you highlight the code and you're like, I need to do this thing. And it's like, there's a magic string. And then you Google that magic string and it doesn't exist but it works. So this is super powerful. The next thing we want to do, because it said that we can use slash explain, is we'll just pop up the chat again, and this time without asking a question, we'll just execute the command directly ourselves. So the benefit of this is you're saving some keystrokes, 
even though it's AI, every time we ask it a question, we always try and phrase it nicely, like, please, Mr. AI, can you give me some stuff? Because one day when you take over the world, like, remember, I asked, please. Um, we don't need that cognitive overload. We can just say slash explain, and it all pops up into the side menu there. And the benefit of having this chat now in the side menu is that you can continue the conversation. So you can see at the bottom there, it says ask copilot or type. That will ask questions on your existing context that you have. Um, so that won't be lost. You could go and do a lot of other work, come back to this later, and that same context is there for you to continue that same conversation, um, which is pretty cool. And then something that was mentioned in the tech news is that we're at the point now of creating a PR. So in our pull request, again, we'll click on the, the sparkles and we'll just generate a title and a description. And then once again, because it's AR, we'll just trust it and go ahead to create. As I mentioned earlier, don't do what I did, do what I'm saying you should do, because that way you'll make better quality stuff. But now that it's in a bigger window to read and not the little VS Code window, if you take a look at that description, you can see it pretty accurately describes what we did. So we added um, some calculations of area and perimeter. Um, we also added some code to our main program so that we could demonstrate that those calculations work. So it's pretty accurate at, at obviously guessing on that, that small little bit of changes that we made. But if you have a much more complex change, this works even better. Um, I think it was this week, maybe last week, I used the feature and it had suggested to me that, oh, you've got this bit of code in there. And I didn't realize that I had actually committed that code. So it went and found some code, highlighted that in the PR, and then I was able to sort of split that out because it was something that was unfinished. So it's really helpful for obviously speeding up your workflow, but then also helping you make sure that you are doing the right things. And then the next thing I want to touch on for GitHub Copilot, um, and this is for those days where I'm, I'm sure everyone's had those days, you're looking at your screen and no matter what you do, you just can't figure out why your code's broken. Like you're just sitting there and hours have passed and your mate said, you want to go for coffee? And you're like, I know I'm addicted to coffee, but I can't, this bug, I just need to figure it out. Well, at the end of lots of those days and for some reason, it still takes me three to four hours before I like, oh, yes, I can do this. This is what I end up doing. And again, I've generally used this for the Microsoft Graph API because it's not super inviting in the way it's documented. So you can see even when you type it badly, so like explain why this could would break sometimes, it gives you helpful information. So it says, well, Sundays are zero. So that's why that could break but it could also break because of an overflow on the ticks. And the little ellipses at the bottom says, well, there's actually a lot more information for this. So when you view that in the chat and you transfer that, that conversation, you can view the full re response that Copilot had for you and then like understand that code more. So it's not just about getting some code, implementing the code, like checking, um, checking it in and moving on to your next task. This, this tool's helped a lot just in general with, like for me, explaining complex little blocks of code. Um, I think everyone's got that person in their team that will take these 10 lines of code that's perfect and then they'll refactor them into one line of Uber code that's just unreadable. Copilot will untangle that complexity for you and explain it nicely. And sometimes if you're lucky, and I've, I've tried this and it's always hit and miss, you, what I like doing is I say to it, can you explain this to me like I'm a fifth grader? And then it just dulls down the terminology. Like it's for those, those days where you're just cognitively super overloaded. Explain to me like I'm a fifth grader. You get the warm and fuzzies. Like it's like, so it works like this, you see. And it just like uplifts you and you just feel amazing. But then other days it completely ignores that I'm a fifth grader part. And it's like, yes, all these big words that you now have to go and Google. But luckily at the bottom of the chat, it also has some, some prompts that say like, what is this? So like it knows when it uses something complex, it needs to give you a little hint that you can click on it and explain that further a little bit. 
So now you've seen what other people have built that helps you build your software better. I think it's time for us to look at, as I mentioned, some services and libraries that you could use in your own applications to help build your own experiences for your customers. And the first one that we'll look at for that, which has been out for a long time, but the service itself and the platform has evolved like an insane amount, is the Azure Cognitive Services. So this is the old branding for it. It's now part of Azure AI Services. But these services themselves are part of sort of the, that are, I think they're part of the original collection. So basically what it is, is as a human, anything that you can cognitively do fits into the bucket of services that belong here. So speech, language, vision, decision, um, those kinds of things. So the reason for me wanting to show this is that a while back I was having a conversation with JK and now it's been like five months, so I can't remember exactly what we said. But I had the idea that I wanted to use these services and see if I could write blogs a lot easier. So I was focusing a lot on making videos, but then my blog was getting neglected and I was looking there and it's like, well, I haven't posted for a year and a half. And I'm like, but I'm sure I just posted the other day. And so the idea of this was to take the, the, the raw video straight out, out of YouTube and pass it through some different pieces of AR and then get a starting point for me to write a blog. So what I did, is I downloaded some CLI tools, so FMPEG um, and the speech synthesizer. Oh, that's a hard word to say this time of the day. Um, and that CLI uses a WAV file. So the first thing I do is convert from an MP4 to a WAV. And I can share this code if anyone's interesting, interested, but a, a short Google gets you this very simply. And the WAV to text uses that S SPX CLI. And for that, you just tell it, go and, like, go and understand this for me. So that runs through that full uh, WAV file, and it's going to extract a full transcript for me. The idea being that if I were to automate this, I could have a nice um, button that says, here's the URL. It downloads it, gets that same thing. I get some text from that. And then what I was working on is a starting prompt. You can see I'll just go and grab that text drop it to, into this prompt, and then I take that prompt straight to ChatGPT again. Um, so reusing your prompts and having some sort of an index for your prompts is super useful for different um, use cases. But you can see in this case, I just pasted it straight in because I've worked a little bit on refining that prompt. And then the output that it gives me is tailored to how I like to try and write blogs, where I have a bit of an in introduction, then the content has a little bit of sort of this is what I'm trying to solve and works towards the solution. And then right at the end, I have a conclusion. And then I also like to over emoji. So generally it's used as punctuation. So you can see emojis are scattered throughout that whole um, solution. Now I didn't end up productionizing this because naturally I procrastinated long enough on this part that better stuff came out. And we'll talk about that better stuff in a very short bit. But as I mentioned earlier, the cognitive services are part of a, a broader a Azure AI services um, product or suite. And in that, you'll see things like the Microsoft, Microsoft Fabric, which is a great way to sort of house all your different data. So if you are going to be making uh, business decisions, obviously you need lots of data um, to draw some insights and context from. Um, you can use the services in there like the ML as a service. Um, obviously, the Azure Open AI services are in there. So that's you using um, Open AI the same way as you would through their services, just through Microsoft and Microsoft's billing. And then there's obviously also the Azure um, AI bot service. And then naturally, like GitHub, scattered throughout all Microsoft products on Microsoft Copilots. It's in Windows, it's in Office. You build a Power Automate flow, it's hanging out there, just wanting to make you better at life, converting Word docs to PowerPoints. Um, it's pretty scary how powerful um, all that tech is. And underneath all that tech is something that Microsoft built called Microsoft Semantic Kernel. So what Semantic Kernel does, um, if you haven't heard um, or seen it, is it allows you to recall some context. So the reason, like, uh, ChatGPT is so useful is that you can 
ask it a question and then you can ask it a question off that question and it's got that previous context and like you would with a conversation with someone in in real life you can uh, obviously remember what each other says and the longer the conversation goes the more likely you are to forget stuff and inside the configuration you can choose whether the the the, the pipeline remembers more short-term or long-term memory so you can tweak what all that uh, what that looks like an analogy that i have to try and make that really sink in um is does anyone use mid journey mid journey okay just a couple of people so mid journey is a um is an ai tool that i think it's housed only in discord at the moment but they're coming out with different um, uis for it but you can pass that a prompt a really nice long prompt um and then it generates you a nice image and then you're like that image is perfect but I want it with the tint of SSW red. So you take your existing prompt and you add on the end, use SSW red. And you're like, yes, this is gonna be perfect. And then your next image comes out, something completely different. I was chatting to um, Seth Daly the other day when I was saying like, it's so frustrating that Mid Journey does that. And apparently there's a way to get your seed and like pass your seed in. Um, but that's not stuff that I've played with, but he has played with that. So maybe uh, ping him if you want to see how you can really tweak the mid-journey algorithm. But now with mid-journey not having that context, the reason I bring that up is because if you're using ChatGPT with Dali on the paid service, what you can do, because it's ChatGPT and it's got all that context, you can tweak your images. So you have an image and you're like, I like that, but can you just change this a little bit? And then can you tweak that? And can you make this red? Can you change that text? And because it's part of your same uh, conversation, it'll make those changes for you. Now you can obviously click on an image and then it will show you the prompt that it's that ChatGPT is passing into Dolly uh, for you. Um, but the experience is pretty nice. So I thought what I'll do um, is I'll share my uh, conversation with ChatGPT to get the images that I use for today's presentation. So hopefully you've noticed that they sort of, they're closely themed to each other. So it's not like I went to 12 different artists and said, hey, can you all make me uh, a slide? And then it's very disjointed. And the way this started is I started very vague. I just said, I need a wide image that represents a session title and abstract. And that's because when I did this previously, I gave it the abstract and then I forgot this time, but then it gave me a nice image. So then I just left it. So I said, this is the title. And then, oh, that was loud. Oh, I switched it off. It gave me an image. I said, let's try showing people with ghosts over their shoulder. Because the idea is coding with ghosts, right? It's like, well, that's a bit busy for me. Can we have less screens, focus, stuff more on the left in this case it didn't focus things on the left but i really like that image and then what you'll see next is i've got 10 out of 10 at the bottom so what i did is i edit each prompt and i use that conversation up until that point as the starting point going into my next image so you can see lots of these images didn't make it and each time i tweaked what i was asking it for to try and get the image that that i want but importantly i took just the context up to that point of our conversation into each of those images and in doing that i was able to get images that are like at least in my mind are very closely related so with some of those i did end up adding more to them and trying to tweak them more so you can see there's a little bit of a scroll bar on this one um, where i had tried to morph this image a little bit and then it didn't go the way i wanted so i went back to the top asked for another iteration and we and we went down if you are interested, obviously, in these different models and you haven't seen already, a shameless plug, we have rules for prompt engineering. There's 31 at the moment. Inside, there's also a cheat sheet that helps you write um, awesome prompts and helps you sort of understand what small bits and pieces you need to provide um, like in this case, like ChatGPT, so that it can give you the the outcomes or the answers that you want with as, as little effort as possible.
But now that I've squirreled down that way again, obviously bring it back to um, the semantic kernel. I think by showing that, it, I hope it makes it clear like the power of having um, being able to recall this this memory and this context. So your, instead of your apps just firing randoms, uh, random calls off, having that context that you can pull into each one will create a much better experience for your customers. And then to illustrate how easy it is to use, uh, Brady, which is, I don't even know where Brady is. Brady built this, the start of um, the timesheet GPT in a weekend. And what this tool does is it connects to your office data. So it connects to your meetings, your emails, and I think some other information. And on a specific day, you can ask it like, what was I doing that day? And then it gives you this cool little summary that says like you're in these meetings, you um, sent these emails off. These are emails that you received, um, which helps you in the case like this, where you need to do timesheets, easily be able to remember, oh yes, this is what I did. Um, and then go and fill in those timesheets. And JK at the back there is looking at making it integrate into our Time Pro product, which is going to be pretty cool. Another sample is from Microsoft themselves. So if you go to uh, github.com slash Microsoft slash uh, chat dash copilot, they've got a sample in there that lets you self host your own sort of chat GPT experience. Um, it just needs a couple of API keys, either to Azure Open API, I always say API, Azure Open AR, um, or to the the normal um, Open AI. And then you can run that, like I said, um, self-hosted on your machine, um, obviously calling out for the prompts. And you can see at the top there, there's documents and plans and, and persona. So what that allows you to do is go and provide uh, what's called a system prompt as well. So you can say like, you are helpful, assistant and then every time someone um, sends a message it's going to use that as part of its its base um, prompt or what how i've used this as well is you upload a bunch of pdfs so you want to know like who are the people say at ssw and if there's some people who doesn't know if you had to go and upload everyone's cv in there it now pulls the context from all of, from all those files that you've uploaded um, and then it's able to get like a pretty good understanding of who everyone is, what experience they have. Um, so it's super powerful. And the sample itself is pretty easy to fire up. So now for the last part where I get to say stuff that may or may not be true, but it doesn't really matter because the future's in the future. And then by the time you guys realize that I was wrong, I'm not standing by you. But then maybe you can ping me on Twitter and be like, hey, you said this thing and it actually happened. How cool is that? We should go for a beer. So the first thing that I think won't be a thing is AI everything. So in the last year, you'll probably have seen like every single product probably that you're using has got an AI tier. Like no matter what it is, you've got a notepad. Don't worry, we've got an AI for that so that you can take notes that the AI can't hear better. I don't know. Like everything has AI on it. And I don't think that's going to be the case in the future. And the reason for that is that we're going to have much more intuitive experiences. So anything that doesn't have AI or that isn't intuitive, that's just not going to exist anymore. And at the moment, I frame this as sort of saying development experiences. But I don't think that's the case because any tools that you've used recently are affected by this. So it's just experiences in general. Whether, like, as I mentioned, if you're in office, office is getting smarter. When you're in your IDE, your IDE is getting smarter. When you're in Windows, Windows is getting smarter. It's not that hard to go and change your power options, but there's a co-pilot for that just in case you need it. And then something that really blew my mind, um, and it's not saying that I was thinking was something that's gonna be in the future, is that a couple of weeks ago at GitHub Copilot, at GitHub Universe, GitHub announced what they're planning to do for in the, in the next coming while. And it's called GitHub Workspaces. And I'm going to let them explain what that looks like because I just wouldn't be able to blow your mind the same way as they will. Every day, millions of developers start from a very familiar place. GitHub issues. 
So we created an AI native workflow that dramatically simplifies the way you use natural language to turn these great ideas into code. We call it the Copilot Workspace. Starting with any GitHub issue, Copilot Workspace automatically proposes a solution based on its deep understanding of the code base, issue replies, link tasks, everything. Copilot Workspace then builds a step-by-step -step plan to implement the changes so that you know exactly what needs to be done. And if something isn't quite right, the spec and plan are fully editable, so you can easily steer Copilot in the right direction. Once you're happy with the plan, simply click Implement and let Copilot chase down the necessary changes across your entire repository. And beyond simply synthesizing code, Copilot Workspace builds and tests the changes and validates that they're successful. It will even run your code so you can verify the fix visually. This looks great! Since the workspace is designed for collaboration, you can edit any of the suggested changes. And if you accidentally introduce an error along the way, Copilot will automatically catch it, repair it, and rerun the code. Once the issue is fixed, it's easy to create a pull request with a generated summary of your work. This lets your team review, merge, and deploy faster than ever. We're building Copilot Workspace so you can turn your creativity into reality every single day. So for me, why this is so amazing is not just because this is an epic piece of tech, but I think it's most engineers love tweaking stuff love getting like as much performance as they can out of things if it's saying visual they like having like the most epic user experience with tools like github um, copilot workspaces it's going to generate 80 90 percent of our solutions for us and then it'll allow us as engineers to focus on that last couple of percent like the percent that we actually passionate about it's going to take away all the tedious uh, tasks away from us to just get us to where we can be in a happy place and really be able to like add value as as engineers if you want to grab any of the resources from today um, you can head over to this link or qr code um, it is hosted in onedrive you can also just ping me on twitter if you want um, to get get access to that cool and then lastly, um, I'd love it if you guys could scan this QR code again, <laughs> or this other QR code um, that will take you to a Microsoft form. Um, if you could just fill that out and give us feedback. Um, when you do give us feedback, you'll be uh, given points inside the SSW Rewards app. And then uh, once you have enough points, you could get one of those watches. I think I think it's the Mi Band thing. One of the one of the ones that Adam was wearing. Um, he he wears a lot of them, as you mentioned. Um, you can end up getting one of those. Um, and that's all from me today. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, go for it. So, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, informative uh, talk. Uh, I want to turn to the audience and ask, do you have any questions that you would like to ask? All right. I'm not seeing any volunteers. So, uh, first of all, how do you see these technologies uh, affecting the development of junior developers? So I think the for junior developers, it's going to help them get started with prototypes uh, much quicker. So I think the, the importance of being able to get those prototypes started and up and running is that you can understand how to break things, which helps you understand how you can build things better. Um, as you don't have to, as a junior dev, do what I did and read reams of documentation to understand, like, how do I build a simple Hello World application? Um, you can build something pretty impressive and get some feedback on that. Um, as I mentioned, with like in the case of workspaces, you make some changes, they're hosting those changes so you can see them, um, which dramatically uh, increases the feedback loop um, for you on software that you're writing. You don't have to, I guess like in the old day, we had a click once deployments. So you send your Windows app out there, someone downloads that, and then you push an app out and they're like, 
here's my new feature. And then like, I don't see it. Have you updated? Oh yes, we have to do that. Like the world moves a lot quicker than that now. Um, and I think junior devs with all this tech that we've got is just going to help them like accelerate much faster than we could long ago. So Jeff on YouTube has asked this question and you've sort of almost answered it. Do you recommend ChatGPT and the use of Copilot for junior developers? Yes. Yeah. Nothing more to say there. It's, cool. ju it's just amazing. Okay. Um, so with all these new technologies to, uh, to write code and to generate this value, where do you see developers generating the most value going forward? Um, I touched on it a little bit earlier, but I think the, the most value for, for where I see us as engineers adding in the future is in those sort of the final percents. So generally um, they say like you, you build 80% of your product in 20% of the time, and then it takes you 80% of the time to build 20% of the product. I think we're now going to be able to focus on that 20% or on that 10% and have most of the other mundane stuff just done for us, um, which is going to help us get better at doing that, which means we can build better experiences. Um, and we don't have to worry about the stuff that like, tools can just do for us. Yeah. So final question, what's the most complex code that you've had AI generate for you that you've been able to put into production? The most complicated is Probably again, I'll go back to the graph API. Um, I was looking for probably two to three days for a solution. Um, for it was something in, I think it was in Outlook um, to do with the meetings that you send out um, and some of those weird and complex like enterprise integrations that you, you get. And I just couldn't figure it out. So that was like the first time where I just tried it out where I was like highlight some code what's the worst that can happen like I need to do this thing I'm using these APIs help a brother out and it's like yes yeah, some code put this magic string there that ends in a random good I'm like oh, <laughs> this is never gonna work hit run it worked and we're using it today in production cool awesome all right ladies and gentlemen can we please have a round of applause for our speaker tonight Gordon Thank you.